right, good morning. How y'all doing? All right, to the five of you that wooed, I appreciate it. I've been wooed. Hey, I'm glad y'all are here. This is, how many, for, let's try it again. They pay me to speak here at reInvent. Isn't that crazy? How many of y'all are here? This is your first session at reInvent. Okay, yes. All right, very cool. That's exciting. Uh, let me tell you where we are. Uh, we are here to talk about containers and, no, that's not true. You're like, oh, I got to get out. So we're going to be talking about building next-gen applications with event-driven architectures. If you're in the wrong place, stay anyway. We're going to have fun. Okay? I can't see you, just so you know. So if I ask you to raise your hand, I, I, oh, there, there, you're still out there. So uh, my name is Eric Johnson. Tell you a little bit about who I am, uh, why I should even be up here. I probably shouldn't, but they let me anyway. Uh, I am a principal developer advocate for AWS. I am a father of five. That is not a typo. Uh, our house is crazy. Now, I'm going to interrupt there for a moment. Uh, has anybody ever heard me speak before? Okay, a couple of you. Okay. Well, we're going to go over the rules anyway. Okay. When I speak, there are rules. Okay. And here they are. And you're thinking to yourself, how do you get to make rules? I have the mic. So. There we go. So rule number one is, this is any number I want it to be, okay? I'm going to hold this up at some point, and I'm going to say I have five kids. And there's always somebody in the back that says, that's not a five, that's a one, okay? I can get to four if I take my shoes off, but it gets real awkward for everybody, okay? So that's any number I want it to be. Rule number two, which one? All right, good for those listening. Someone coming in late saying, I don't get it. These are quotes, not apostrophes. <laughs> and I know that, because this looks silly. Never, never fails. Is he doing a bunny? I'm not doing a bunny unless I am. And it's contextual, you have to figure it out, okay? And the last rule is these are thumbs. Okay, I do this all the time. I'm like, hey, you good? And they're like, I'm good, but I don't know what you're pointing at yourself. But I'm not pointing at myself unless I am. So I, I was born this way. I didn't wake up this way for the first time today. If I did, I would not be here with you. Okay? Uh, I like to make lots of jokes. Uh, I, I'm comfortable with that. If that makes you uncomfortable, I'm also comfortable with that. So <laughs> either way, I'm good. All right, so let's get started. So continue on, I'm a brand new grandpa. I took everything in me not to put a bunch of slides of my grandson up there, thank you. Uh, I am a drummer that used to say musician, but people are like, really? So I am a drummer, I went through college playing drums and here's what I learned. I am a phenomenal drummer for one finger. Past that, I'm pretty average <laughs> and nobody's gonna pay me, all right? It's always fun to go in. I played in a lot of churches in college. And I would go in, you could always see, because I was hired out, they would call me in. When I would get there, you could always see them going, oh no, what have we gotten ourselves into? So that was always fun, because they're a church. They can't tell you, never mind, we're not paying you. So I like to sit down and take one stick in my hand and go, okay, let's rock. <laughs> so, lots of fun. I am also a foodie, <laughs> obviously. I do like to eat. I, often people ask me, how do you feed yourself? Oh, I feed myself. I figured it out, so. All right, enough about me. Let's jump into this. Today we're gonna to be talking, like I said, about uh, building next-gen applications with event-driven architectures, All right? So we're gonna talk about some of the challenges, some of the, some of the things that, that we wanna be aware of, uh, and so let's jump in. So we're gonna cover three things, kind of break it down. Uh, first is we're gonna talk about enterprise integration patterns. What does that even mean? We're gonna, you know, okay, we, we hear this word all the time, but what does it mean? We're gonna talk about event-driven architecture, right? We, we've been throwing this word around for quite a while. EDA is not new, we didn't invent it, but we're really doubling down on it. We think it's, the, it's really the best way to build architectures. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about that idea. And finally, we'll talk about handling event duplication using item potency. And, and this one's always a challenge. When we talk about that, and a lot of times when we talk, and I've done it myself, when we talk about uh, EDA or any kind of architecture, we talk about building large distributed systems, we say, and make sure they're, they're built for item potency. And then we leave it at that, and you see everybody going, okay, that makes sense. I don't know what you're saying, but I'll do that. So we're gonna dive into a little bit, what does that mean today? 
I've already been asked, this is not that Dr. Pepper, because my wife made me promise to drink water while I'm talking, so it'll be that Dr. Pepper later. All right, so we're gonna jump in here. So the first thing, enterprise integration patterns. When we talk about integration patterns, one of the things we talk about a lot is coupling. We throw this word around, you decouple your apps, be careful you're not tightly coupled, all these kinds of things. And coupling is integration's magic word, right? And it's this A to B, A requires B, it's this, this, this when we say couple, it's this idea of I'm reliant on you. And coupling is, is the measure, I, I love this, it's the measure of independent variability between connected systems. Because coupling can be variable, sometimes it's entirely. If you're down, I'm down. Sometimes it's kinda. If you're down, I could survive, but I need you to come back up pretty soon, okay? Decoupling has costs. When we build distributed architectures, decoupling has costs, both at, at, at design time and run time. Coupling isn't binary. Okay, sometimes it's more than one thing. It goes, is a lot of things. And finally, coupling isn't one dimensional. So there's a lot of different things that, that can relate to that. And when I was starting to put this together, and we're starting to think about this, it's like, how many different ways can we couple? So we put down a list here. This probably isn't all of them. But when you think about coupling, you may not have thought about some of these. We have te technology dependencies, like what language? Well, we can only build in Java. And before we started building applications with something like a Lambda function, that's kind of what we did. When we're gonna build, this is the language we build in. You're tied to that, there's no changing. Now Lambda kind of changed that paradigm because we said, you know what, you can have a function that's in Python, you can have a function that's, function that's in Java, whatever is best for that particular function that you need to do. Okay, you can have location dependency, only this IP address, data format dependency, data type dependency, Semantic dependency, one we're gonna talk about quite a bit today is temporal dependency, sync versus async. Interaction style dependency, how are we talking? And, and conversation dependency, pagination, things like that. So different ideas in coupling that, and, and coupling, we say this because you hear it's like, you should always decouple, 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 decouple. Coupling is not an evil word, but you wanna understand your coupling, okay? And I love this quote. This is Gregor Hope, who, who actually works for AWS. He says, the appropriate level of coupling depends on the level of control you have over the endpoints, okay? How much control you have over the endpoints is going to decide how much you're reliant on that, or should. And sometimes, like, look, I need it, I can't help it, we've gotta have it, we're gonna use it, so whatever they dictate, we're gonna do. But sometimes, it's like, look, we have no control over that. If they go down, we go down, so we need to pull back our coupling, make that less reliant on those, those systems. So let's talk about some of those things as we're, as we're looking at building applications, we're looking at building distributed applications, let's talk about uh, the, the, two, the types of, of patterns that we would use. So the first, and this is, I, when I speak to developers, a lot of times they really struggle with this idea of synchronous versus asynchronous. So let's kind of talk about this a little bit and, and point this out. So the first we're gonna talk about is the synchronous request response model. So the synchronous request, request response model, that's a, that's a big, those are big words. Um, this is basically what this looks like, okay? So you have this, you have a sender, you have a receiver, you make the request, it comes back. And this is often what we call also a blocking call. Because what it means is, when I've made that call, I can't do anything else until you respond to me. I am completely reliant on you. Now there's some advantages of this, is very low latency, right? It's a quick call, uh, it's simple. Yes, I'm not having to do a lot of distributed stuff. And finally, it's a fast fail, okay? How many of y'all look at fast fail as a, an advantage? Okay, good, good, that's right. Fast fails are good for us, because we want them to fail when we're developing. Okay, it's always beautiful to get a fully distributed system in and, and four steps down is where it's failing and I don't know until it's in production, right? I've been there, anybody been there? Yeah, exactly. If you didn't raise your hand, lucky dog or liar. So, okay. But disadvantage is, you know, what if your receiver fails? So we talked about this. If my receiver fails, my sender's dead in the water. Oh, okay, I'd love to take your payment but I gotta wait, okay? That's something, because a client, what client in the world is gonna go, oh, oh, you can't make payment processing right now? I'll wait. 
No, they're gonna, you know what, I can go over to a, a little startup called Amazon.com and buy that. Okay, so they, they, you, you, want, you don't want your client down, you want him up and running. Okay, so that's first thing. The second thing is throttling, okay? So as you start building more and more systems talking to this, this is your central point of failure, okay? Or single point of failure would be a better way to say, I can do that one, single, <laughs> single point of failure, okay? So that's, that, that could cause problems, right? So you have receiver failure, you have, we have you have throttle failure, or receiver throttle, it may not be down, but it's definitely slowing down, right? And, and to today's culture, slow is broken, right? Slow is the new broken, there you go. I'm gonna put that on a shirt somewhere. All right, so let's jump to the other one. And I'll tell you, here's a pattern. We always recommend always go asynchronous when you can. There are times for synchronous. I am not here to tell you you use synchronous and you're not a, a 10X developer, whatever that means, right? There are some times when you need synchronous, but try asynchronous first. When you can use asynchronous, do it. But there are some advantages and disadvantages on that. So let's look at these. So there's a couple of ways of doing asynchronous. The first we're going to talk about is the point-to-point -point model, or a queue. So what does that look like? So you have, you have a sender, and you have a, re a receiver, much like before, but now you have a queue in the middle of it, right? So you can be sending things into the queue, and then as, as the receiver's ready, they'll handle that, but this becomes an asynchronous model. What the sender gets, if you're not familiar with this model, what the sender is gonna get asynch or synchronously, I know we're talking about async, but synchronously is a, I got your request, thank you very much, we'll get back to you, okay? It's an acknowledgement of, this, of the data, the event, whatever, being sent in. Right? Then later, they'll need to either pull or, or web socks or somehow and get the response back if we need to. This is what we often call fire and forget. Excuse me. Sorry, you have to hear me slurp on the mic there. Apologize for that. Okay, so again, you have, it decreases temporal coupling. So we've, we've now, our sender is not broken, okay? If, if, if the receiver breaks down, the sender is still working uh, if they, if, you know, if they need to, they're just, it's just going into the queue. And when the receiver is ready, it can grab more. So if it goes down and we bring it back up, we haven't lost those requests. It's resilient to receiver failures, we just talked about, and the receiver controls consumption rate, right? So that's important. Okay, it's just a little statement down there. If you think about downstream applications, a lot of times, I've been there, and I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I will mine. When we come in, we work for a company, and it's like, hey, we have this legacy system that can handle three requests per day, <laughs> right? That's probably an exaggeration a little bit, but it's, it can do three requests per second. But unfortunately, we're getting a billion requests per second. We need you to make that work. All right, well, let's rebuild it. No, 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 no. No, we want you to make that work. Okay, well, let's add more to it. No, no, no. So what happens is you, you need to maintain these legacy systems that can't handle that traffic. So this is where a queue becomes very handy. Because one, you're not invoking that system, you're not running that system for each and every event coming in. You're now able to batch those events, okay? So if they're small and you can run 100 at a time, uh, this gives you a lot of control. So this receiver controls consumption rate helps you protect your downstream system. Okay, we talk about that when people build with serverless all the time, is yeah, serverless scales like crazy, but a lot of times it's talking to our legacy systems that can't handle that. So this is one way to maintain that and control that. Okay, so what happens here is what if, what if one of the events goes bad? What if something breaks? Well, in our, in our send receive, in our synchronous model, we lost the data, which is always great when someone's making a payment and you take the payment you process it and it breaks, and then you go back to the customer and go, hey, we lost your card number. Go ahead and give it to us again. You can trust us, okay? Your credibility is being shot there, right? So this time, now it's persisted. It's in that queue uh, because we say, okay, do it. Now, if, if something happens, the queue can be programmed to retry or configured to retry and to handle errors and Worst case scenario, drop to a dead letter queue so we don't lose the data, it just needs some manual intervention or maybe some other automation that you have, okay? So you have this resiliency built in automatically by using a queue uh, or a point-to-point -point model. 
All right. So another, uh, another advantage to this here is only one receiver can, can consume each message. And, and this kind of, people look at the queue, and the way it works is when, and, and I'll get more into this later, when a queue is working, what will happen? We'll have several copies of it for redundancy. And then when you grab that, one of your systems grabs those uh, items off the queue, it actually doesn't remove it from the queue. It just hides it, okay? It hides it until you say, I've processed it, okay? And then it removes it. And so what happens is it keeps other, other receivers from grabbing it so you can, you can make sure that it's, for the most part, we're going to get into that at the end of this, that it's only once or a, a read at least once. So, okay. A couple of disadvantages, response correlation. What happens if there is a problem and I, and I need to figure out where that goes? You want to be sure, and, and again, we'll talk about the item, item potency a little bit later. Backlog recovery time. If it goes down, sometimes you, when you've got to recover those. But we say disadvantage, maybe it's like just a known thing because that's better than losing all the data, right? Ag agreed? Anybody in the room go, ah, I'd just rather lose it. Let's start fresh. Okay, because I want to hire you. So, okay. And finally, uh, fairness and multi-tenant systems. So, uh, this kid, if you have really hot items grabbing and stuff, you can, you can run into some, making sure that's balanced out. All right. My clicker. Hang on a sec. There we go. All right. So, the service we use for this, if you're not familiar with this, I've been talking about it, is, is Amazon SQS. I heavily encourage you to look at this. This is one of the models. We'll talk about a couple other ones. But if you're looking to deal with that, there's, there's FIFO uh, queues where you can keep things in order. Uh, and so this is the service that we use. It's a fully managed message queue. It scales almost infinitely. I love that number. How, how do you scale almost infinitely? So close to infinite, I can't even tell you the numbers. It handles mass amount of traffic. Simple, easy to use, has DLQ, as we pointed out, and again, the FIFO, like I said. All right, so the next pattern we have is a point-to-point -point model here, is a, is a router model, okay? So in this, we see this a lot, okay? Let's say you need to route between, uh, some, sometimes receiver green has to get some stuff, sometimes receiver blue has to get some stuff. What happens is we see a lot of people build this in and the disadvantage is, first of all, we're talking coupling. We want to reduce coupling, right? This is increases coupling. Only blue can get blue. Only green can get green, right? And it also, and this is a big one, the sender maintains the logic. Now, my title, I think I told you, is developer advocate. But the truth is, I'm a hack developer, OK? most brittle part of your application is going to be Eric Johnson's code. There's no lie about that. It doesn't say hack developer on my card, because that's pretty long. But it should. The thing about this is, my mantra is, if all else fails, then code, right? Only code when you have to. Use configuration, let the services do their work. And this is one place where, in this, the, the sender is maintaining all your logic. It's having to evaluate and route based on data. And that's a lot of unnecessary code that you really don't need. Let me show you. It gets more complex when we start adding more. No application or very few applications is two functions. Two functions, we're up and running, we're making a million dollars. If you did that, that's great. But the reality is you start building in more features, more functions, uh, things like that, and you end up now you got a purple and a dark blue and a light blue and a green and a yellow, and you have a lot of these things, and your sender is now a big long list of if-thens, right? And if-thens are the worst or switches, right? Or whatever smart code thing. I'm, I'm a hack, you know, I'm an architect. So, so that's, that's where that becomes a problem. So how do we fix that? Okay, so the, as the asynchronous message router model using a bus. Let me show you how that works. So instead of the sender doing it, the sender now only needs to know of one thing, and that's an event bus. Okay, and so what we do is we drop all this stuff onto the event. We just say, hey, here you go. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. And we just pump it in. And that takes all that logic out of that sender. And it happened. Now, now it's uh, at the bus. So how do we divide? We still need the blue to get blue and the green to get green. So what do we do? Well, with our bus, we're able to assign rules and say, if you're green, go to this endpoint. If you're blue, go to this endpoint. 
and they can be much more complex. We do a lot of different things. We can target a lot of different, you know, uh, APIs and, and Lambda functions and whatever, and a lot of that happens just simply using rules. So this logic is pulled out of your Lambda function or your sender, it may not be a Lambda function, maybe something else, and it's put into configuration. The service we use for that is EventBridge. Okay? Now, if you're not familiar with EventBridge, and I hope you are, we talk about it a lot, but it's always funny when I say EventBridge, you go, oh, I've not heard of that one. Let me tell you a little bit about EventBridge and how it works. So it comes with multiple parts. Right? So the first is you can have all kinds of producers for EventBridge. You can have, you know, you can have SaaS. You can have your own application. You can have AWS services. There's all type of things that can dump events on a bus, right? So then in your bus, you can have a custom bus. You can have your own, your default. Did you know you already have a default bus? Just so you know, if you have an AWS account, you already have a default bus. You can make your own. You can use that. Those all go into that. Then what we do is we use these rules. And these are pattern matching, where you can say, if it matches this pattern, do this. Do this target. And those targets, again, a Lambda function, uh, an S SNS. Boy, my eyes are going here. All kinds of things. There's all kinds of targets that you can do. Therefore, now your logic is in EventBridge and not at your Lambda function or your sender. And this gets important because you're, you're centralizing that logic because reality is you're probably going to have more than one sender, more than one client. Maybe you have a different mobile client. Maybe you have, a, I mean, all kinds of different clients that are doing this. So rather than having to repeat that logic, you just do it at the, at the event bridge. So what does that look like? So here's, here's an example of a simple event, right? We have a simple event. It has a currency in it of AU, right? So we can write a rule that says, hey, if the currency equals AU or NZ, then do something. In this particular instance, it is AU, so we have a match. That's how the rules work. Nothing terribly complex. You don't have to write you know, pages and pages of Python to match the rule. You just simply write a JSON object that says, does it match? And we have a lot of granularity on that that you can build out. In fact, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got teams that are using this all over, companies that are using this all over to just ship events around. And when we talk next about next-gen applications, event-driven is what we're talking about. So we want to be able to handle these events and do the right thing with the event. So with this, there's multiple targets. This is 20-plus uh, examples here. You see EC2, SQS, Glue. Uh, I won't read them all, but you can see, them, see those there. Uh, and then and the one I do want to point out down the bottom right-hand corner is the API destination. So if you've got to make a call somewhere else, uh, that API destination uh, is very helpful. All right, so that, that's kind of some of the patterns, the integration patterns we talked about, decoupling, what does that look like, how do we do that? So the second thing I want to talk about is actually event-driven architectures. And it's fun because people ask me to define what is event-driven architecture. Uh, and, and like I said, we didn't invent event-driven architecture, but the interesting thing is, while not all event-driven architecture is serverless, all serverless is event-driven architecture. Okay, so when you use serverless, and that's, you know, that's this, where this falls under, you're using event-driven architecture. So here it is. This, if you get anything, this is the most technical part of the talk, so try to hang with me. I'll probably do it twice, okay? So here's event-driven architecture. You ready? All right. Something happens, and we respond. <laughs> do you want me to do it again? All right, I got you. It's hard. Something happens, and we respond. That's event-driven architecture. Thank you. Thank you. That's event-driven architecture, obviously, at its simplest form, right? But this idea is, rather than these functional do this, now do this, now do this, now do this, it is, I'm going to generate an event, and if you need to do something, do something. React to it. Subscribe to, the, to a topic. You get, get a rule on an event bridge. We're passing events around. So let's climb into that a bit. All right. Here's what I found. OK. I'm not talking to you, Siri. All right. So we look at it, it happens all the time. So, uh, so think of a property and event. What does an event look like? There's several things. And you can see this. And not all events are exactly alike, but this is a good example. You have metadata and you have data. OK, the metadata is about the event. The data is the data of the event, right? So there's differences here. Events are signals that a system's state 
has changed. Something happened. So what does the event look like? I've, I've written data to a DynamoDB table. I've dropped something into an S3 bucket. I've pushed an IoT button. When I first started doing this, not this talk, but a talk similar to this, years ago, I got one of those IoT buttons, and it was all about IoT, and I got an IoT button, and I wrote a Lambda function, and the, and the, program, or the program was, every time I would click it, it would send my wife a text message that says, I love you, which I thought was cute until I was demonstrating it. Yep, 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 yep. Finally, I got a text back for it that says, stop loving me. <laughs> right now. So I changed it. An event, something happens. Metadata, how long did I push the button? How hard did I push the button? When did I push the button? Data, which button did I push? All kinds of things about it. So you have information, so it's a change in state. Events occur in the past, okay? These are events that something happened, we collected the data, here's the event. They cannot be changed, they're immutable. This is what happened. And they decrease coupling by restricting information to key data, okay? So we're saying, here it is, here's your key data. If A, B, and C need to do something, they, they're not reliant on each other, they're not reliant on this, they're just reliant on the information in the data. So let's look at how that, how that looks here. So let's say we've got, uh, so we're gonna talk sparse versus full state descriptions. And here's what I mean when I was saying decoupling by, by giving key data. Sometimes it's hard to decide what is the key data. I've seen folks like their, their events have 300 lines, okay? Color blue, description. Well, not blue, but kind of blue, maybe purple. You know, all kinds of different things, all right? So then there's other ones who just put, this is the order ID. You wanna know more, talk to me. So how do you find that balance? Well, some things to consider. So in a sparse event, you have this on the left here. It's got the order 123 was created at 10.47 a.m. by customer 456, that's it, okay? Whereas we have more information, the current status is open and the total was $237.51 and more, 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 more data. So what happens when you use this, okay? So when we send it, so we might have people say, okay, there's not enough detail here what, what are the details? Where do I get those, right? So you wanna think about how much can I put in this event? But there is a risk when you get too much. So let's say when you do a full state, so you got here order ID, you got status, you got total, uh, different things. What happens is the event schemas should be backwards compatible, all right? So when we think about that and why does this matter with the full state, when I'm making something backwards compatible, Let's say I've got 10 services consuming this event. If they expect a certain record or name or something in camel case that needs to stay there. But if you need to change it, and we see this is, this is a living example, okay? We had record ID, camel case, large R, large I, record ID. They needed snake case, low R, dash ID. So now what happens is you can't remove record ID, camel case, now you have to add record ID, snake case right under, and now you're populating two fields with the same number because you need to maintain backwards compatibility. Okay, so these are things to think about, and that may be a case, look, I have to do it. We had no choice, okay? That may, there may be a case in that, but these are things to think about as you're, as you're building that in, okay? But what happens on that is as you get more, it becomes more costly to compute this. Okay, I'm passing bigger data around, I'm having to work through different things. Just keep that in mind as, as you're scaling larger, okay? All right, so we often talk about when we're building event-driven architectures, and I'm sorry, it's just really dry up here, or here in Vegas. And I'm doing all the talking, obviously. So, when we talk about building distributed architectures, event-driven architectures, there's a couple of words we're gonna learn here. That's choreography is the first one. And choreography or choreograph is events between domains using subscriptions, okay? So domains, how do we break our domains out? We have retail, we have fulfillment. Uh, a lot of times I encourage you to look at uh, some of the parameters that you need when you're breaking that out. Uh, but let's, let's use these for our examples. So the idea here is, hey, instead of send something out to everybody who needs that, I want you to notify me when, it, when an order is created. So I'm gonna subscribe to you, okay? Now, what happens is when an order is created, then they get notified. Order's created, I'm gonna send a notification. 
So that choreography goes between the domains. Okay, so orchestration is we're going to orchestrate a business process within the domain. How do we orchestrate how the events move through the domain and get used? So here's our order. So we have an order up. Retail sends it out. We have an inventory manager. They check. Is it in stock? Yes, it is in stock. If it is, then create an order. All right, I've created an order. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to send out, I'm going to generate another event. And the service that we're using in this example is step functions because it's made to orchestrate. It's made to do just that. How many of y'all familiar with step functions? Okay, part of the room, but not all the room, okay? I encourage you to go out of the room right now and look up step functions. No, I'm just kidding, don't do that. But I do encourage you as soon as you can to learn about step functions because if you find yourself doing a lot of choreography or, or I'm sorry, orchestration in your function, writing a lot of code to go, if you're this, then this, then this, then this, then this, that's probably not the best way to do it. What you want is a step function, especially with when you can just drag and drop and build. And step functions uses SDK to, to integrate. And look, we'll, jump, we'll jump into that a little bit. So the step functions, it's a workflow. You can build the step functions. They're called, they're called state machines. Uh, you know, and, and each step of your workflow is called a state. So it's how, what's the data look like as you're moving through? When you execute your state machine, each move from one state to the next is called a state transition. And that's exactly what you're doing. So you're saying, hey, this is my state. Now I need to process some data. Reach out to a Lambda function to process it. Great. Now I need to process some more data. Maybe I'm going to do a translation. I'll talk directly to translate come back, and so I'm changing the data in the state so as it's moving through. And how you build those is you, you have a def definition, you define it in JSON, you can, CDK is just one example, you can use SAM as well. Uh, there's other uh, IEC choices you can use. Uh, and it, we've got like the data science SDK you can use in there. And then you visualize it, and I, I'm not showing in here, and, and I'll probably add it later, but the Visual Workflow Studio where you literally just drag and drop boxes and configure. Okay, it's just phenomenal, right? You visualize it and then you execute and monitor and you can monitor each loop, okay? State, step functions help you iterate. It helps you do parallel um, processing so, and you can monitor and, and, and watch the, or and, and evaluate each of that as it's going through. All right, so step function integration types, you have optimized, optimized integrations. Uh, you can customize to simplify the uses of 17 AWS services, so these are direct integrations. But we also have SDK integrations. This was, this was uh, announced last year and is a game changer. Okay, what this means is Step Functions has the AWS SDK built right into it. So rather than you calling a Lambda function that then uses the SDK to talk to a service, Step Function talks directly to a service. So this takes a lot of code out. When people hear me talk, they're like, do you not like Lambda? I love Lambda. Don't, don't go out of here going, Eric's against Lambda functions. Eric's going to get fired when you say that. Okay? I love Lambda functions when they're appropriate. I'm a big believer in the right tool for the right job. Uh, and so if you find yourself, and, and even uh, uh, Jay Nair, who's, who's charged Lambda big and Lambda is known, who's been doing Lambda longer than any of us, he said a Lambda function should be used to transform and not transport. If you're just passing data around, get it out of there, okay? All right, so let's take a look at how these work. So if you think about uh, the request response in a, in, a, in a step functions, let's say we get a signal that says, hey, something's in a bucket, we need to do something, we can do a call, a synchronous request and get the response back. We can then, the next phase, we'll then do a synchronous request to a Lambda function and get it back. Again, there are times when synchronous makes sense. Uh, and then finally, you're a jewel. I love you. Thank you very much. All right. All right. And then finally, what happens is we can do an async request to EventBridge saying, we've done this work. We're done. Okay. So synchronous, synchronous, async. I didn't write any code. I didn't have to do anything. I just simply did it. The only code I did is maybe some custom transformation in the Lambda function. And the nice thing is it works in all these services including the AWS SDK, so I can talk to so many of these different ones. Another pattern you can use is the wait for task token. Have, it, have any of y'all ever been to the serverless espresso booth? Oh, good. Anybody planning on going to the serverless espresso booth? All right, okay. 
Yeah, there's a couple of you I know out there had better, okay? So the serverless espresso booth, we use this all the time. A step function runs when you order coffee, and you, what you'll do is you go up, you'll scan a barcode, you do your phone number, get a token, you'll enter your menu, and then we'll make it all, and it's all done just the way I'm showing you with, the, with uh, these different patterns. I picked up my phone. That's not going to work. All right. So the wait for call, uh, the wait for task token. How this works is we're going to get it, we're going to make a call, and we're going to pass a task token, okay? Uh, step functions will do that for you. It sends it out. It says, okay, here it is. Now, we're going to do something. Other, we're going to pass that to the receiver, but what if it fails? Well, then we pass that task token back to a Lambda function that maybe handles the failure and does some code, uh, and then the system ends it. But if, it's, if it works, then we send it back, and the step function moves on. Now, here's an interesting thing. A standard step function or state machine can wait up to one year. For interaction, okay? Be, wow, one year, why would I use that? Well, let's say you have to order some things, you have to manual some things, and you're checking things. Okay, this is done. Okay, now, once that's done, I need to do this. So you see this orchestration power of saying, this has to happen first, then this has to happen, then these five things can happen, and now this has to happen once all five are done. So you have this ability to wait and say, is it done? And that's how, that's how it works. The other pattern we have, Get my clicker to work there. There we go. Uh, is the, is the run, a, run a job sync? This doesn't work with all our services, but some of our services. And how this works is you're actually going to send out, uh, let's, let's say Athena. You're going to send it, and you're going to say to Athena, when you're done, sync with me. Let me know. So it lets them know. And then what we can do is we can then do a second one that says get the results. So we start a job. When you're done, let me know. I'll sync that up. Okay, now I'm going to grab the results. I'm going to do something with them. And then I'm going to drop an event into EventBridge to say, this is done. OK, so there's these different patterns that you can look at. This particular one does not work with the SDK, so just keep that in mind. It only works with those particular services. All right, so when you're building applications, when you're building distributed, it's, it's, it's important to understand orchestration and choreography, how to use them together Choreograph between your domains, moving events around. I'm passing around with event bridge. I'm passing around with, you know, I'm using queues, things like that. Internally, how do I orchestrate? Step functions is, is, is your go-to on that, right? So let step functions be that central orchestrator and then call your lambda function or your whatever to do that. You can call a step function synchronously or asynchronously by default, but you can also call it synchronously as well. And don't do that if you don't have to, but it's possible. All right, so. The last part of this we're going to talk about, our last section, is handling event duplication using item potency. Has anybody struggled with item potency? Okay, good. We have a couple. Anybody go, I don't know what that is, Eric. Okay, good. Don't be a shy to raise your hand. When I went to work for AWS, I remember coming into AWS and uh, thinking, man, I'm the big dummy in the room. And that was true. <laughs> that was right. But I sat in the rooms and said there was all these acronyms being thrown around, these big words, EBITDA, and well, pff, I don't know what that means. Item potency was one of them. Finally, about six months in, I went, okay, whatever. I raised my hand. Yes, Eric? So I don't know what that means. And the funniest thing is about six other people in the room went, yeah, I don't know what that means either. <laughs> I've been sitting in here for three years, have no clue. So if you don't know, ask. So item potency, all right? So we're going we're gonna to tell you. What is item potence, item potency, item potent? They're said different things. The basic idea is, mathematical operations, is that it can be applied multiple times without changing the results. Okay, let's, let's jump in. The idea is, no matter how many times I send the same request, my system should only handle it once and return the right response each time. Okay, so it's basically watching for duplicates. Duplicates can be tough. And, and in distributed systems, this is going to happen. Things are going to break. Werner Vogel says everything breaks all the time, right? It happens. At AWS, we build for it not to break or design for it not to break, but build for expecting it to break. Things happen, right? And so you need to be able to account for that in your system. So let's talk about uh, how that works. So. Uh, uh, Hope and Wolf in their book, they said a message that has the same effect whether it's received once or multiple times. That's what I said, but they say it better and more eloquent. All right, 
And when it really comes down to, did that, and this goes back to our story earlier, did that internet charge my card or not? Or is it charged twice? I mean, anybody gotten a call from their mom? I have. I think I've been charged four times. Like, man, I understand twice, but a third and a fourth time, mom? Come on. All right, so how do we deal with that? All right, so multiple things when we deal with, with uh, duplication. So the first thing is problem sending acknowledgement. So let's say we have a sender, okay, and we've got a receiver. We send the request, the receiver gets it, processes the request, and sends the response. Ah, didn't work. Okay, something happened. Internet went down, kids are watching too many movies, something happened, right? Okay, you have a timeout. So the sender says, well, did it work or not? So we send another one, okay? So this is our duplicate message. It's the same request, but we've had to manage that at the client and the acknowledgement, it happens. And now the sender says, great, it worked, I'm good. But the receiver now has two records, okay? We've got a duplicate. Here's another way that can happen. Problems processing the message. Okay, so you have, let's, let's use SQS for an example. In SQS, we have a sender, they send it in, and remember I said what we do is we keep multiple copies, right, in different places for, for reliability in case one, something goes down, something happens. So then you get your receiver, and your receiver grabs a copy, okay? So we lock that in a system. We say, hey, this is hidden. Don't do anything, all right? So then, when the receiver can't send it back, it gets unlocked, right? But nothing happens, right? So another receiver comes in. But the, the thing about this is, let's go back here real quick. This receiver was able to maybe not process it. We don't know. That's, that's the, how far in the process did it get? Did it charge the card? Did it read the card? Did it, what did it do, right? So then, then it comes back, then another one comes in and grabs it, says, okay, I'll handle it, and then it goes away. So then it's like, well, what happened? Did it get processed or not, okay? So the third thing we're gonna look at is, is the at least once delivery. Let me get a drink here real quick. So in this one, we have our sender, they send it in, we got all our copies, right? The receiver grabs it, does its work, sends it back, but it doesn't get marked complete, okay? Things break, it happens, right? So what happens is another receiver grabs it and grabs another, he grabs a copy of it, okay? So either we had a problem with it not getting marked hidden or we just had a problem with getting a copy. So now again, we've got a duplicate. All right, so these are some of the issues. So, so what, the answer to this, okay, is idempotent tokens, all right? So we're gonna show you how to use idempotent tokens. If you use Java or Python, uh, or I think there's .NET, there's, a, there's um, Power Tools is something I would encourage you to look, and I'll be, I'll be using some of their example from Power Tools in Python. But this is how it works, okay? A well-behaved idempotent token is generated by the client. The client needs to be aware of the token. Don't have it generated on your backside, something like that. The client needs to be aware, okay? They, like I said, they're generated by the client and they're generated by the client on retry. So the client should know, oh, that didn't work, let's send the same token again, okay? They should be unique per message. Doesn't do us any good if they're not unique, right? And finally, uh, use a dedicated field separate from message content. We'll talk through that in just a second. So what does that look like? Well, this is how we handle it in Power Tools, okay? So before you do this, you need to create a DynamoDB table and that'll, that'll handle it. So what we do is the first thing we do is we actually send the request, okay? And in the Lambda function, we will actually immediately grab the ID from the client, okay? So we grab the ID and we set it in, in DynamoDB and we write to uh, the DynamoDB table and it's locked. Hey, this is being worked on. Don't do anything else with that ID, okay? Then what we do is we process the Lambda function. This is where the code runs, this is your code, right? Once that code is run, we then update that record in the Lambda function. Okay, so now, now we've got it. So this is the response that we're saving in the Lambda, I'm sorry, in DynamoDB. We're saving that response, then we update the record with the result and we respond to the client. All goes well, right? Okay, 
So let's see how this works. So when your client comes in, we again, we do this, we do everything that I just explained there, but what happens when the response doesn't get back to the client? Well, what we'll then do is we'll say, oh, the client says, you know what? I didn't get that back, so I'm gonna try again with the same token. That's important. So I send it, and we read, and we go, oh, that already exists. We, we've got already processed that, so here's your response. And we just send the same response that was stored in the DynamoDB table, okay? So remember, we're getting the same response no matter how, how many times we send this. This is very important. This is a good way to handle idempotent, and I really encourage you to grab the power tools. Uh, if you want to take a picture of this screen, grab that link. Uh, but I will tell you, I have one QR code at the end, has all the resources on a page. So actually, you don't even have to, you don't have to grab this. Just grab the QR code at the end. All right. So when we look at item potency duration, how long is that going to last? We've got some defaults. The Lambda Power Tools, by default, you can change it, is one hour. Amazon SQS does five minutes. SNS does five minutes. Step Functions does 90 days. Why 90 days? Because we can wait up to a year. Remember that? So. Let's look at some examples. So in SQS, this is with a FIFO queue. That's a first in, first out queue. That holds order. This is how it's going to work. So we generate a token. So this is just a bash script, right? Or this is in a command line. So we generate a token. There's our token. All right, then we're going to send. This is just using the CLI as an example. We're going to send a request. And you can see the message deduplication ID is the token. The response we get. You can see the message ID in there, and we get a response and everything worked fine. So then we're going to test it, and we send the same token again, and we get the same response. All right, so it's going to handle that automatically for you. If you look at how we do that in step functions, in step functions it's the same way. We have a state machine ARN. I'm sorry, how are you doing? We have, a, yeah, we have a name token there. This is, it's called the name. That's actually how we, how we do them uh, individually with state machine runs. So that's the name that it's going to run. So we pass that. We get a response back. Uh, and then you run it again. And you get the same response back. So we, we already know what the results from that run is. We're not going to dupe that. If you want to run that process again, then change the name. So for EventBridge, with EventBridge, we take, and you can see here, this is just an event that we're going to drop in. When we send it, we get a response back. It says, here's your event ID. We send it again. Uh-oh. Not. That's right. EventBridge is not idempotent, right, because you're sending events all over the place, and it could be that you're doing multiple things, right? So it's not idempotent, so what do you do? So to get around this, we're going to create, so the event ID is not idempotent, like we said. In the metadata, we're going to create a key called idempotency key, or really anything. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we're going to create a key, OK? And in that, when we send this, so let's, let's walk through the process again. We send this. We're going to send that as our token in the idempotency key. We're going to get an event back. If we send it, then what? Now, you notice I didn't send it again because it's still going to happen. Okay? Adding an item potency key is not going to make EventBridge item potent. What it's going to do is allow you on your back end to look at that key and say, I've already done something like that. Okay? So you're aware of that. Okay? And like I said, item potency by any other name would smell as sweet, the item potency ID. These are some examples of what folks use. You can, you can call it Bob if you want. I would encourage you to call it something unique. Uh, but name it something. Because when you think about it, an item potency token flows through intermediaries. It's going to go through a lot of things. And if you use message ID, going in is one, two, three. The next one changes it to four, five, six. The third one changes it to seven, eight, nine. That doesn't do you any good. When you get it back, your comparison falls down, doesn't it? Okay, so when you're working with that, that's important to understand. I know what my item potency token is. I know how that's going to work, and so I may name it, you know, Bob123 loves me, right? So that's the name. People go, what does that mean? I know. That's all that matters, right? So when it flows through, you get it back. I promised you at the end I would give you a QR code. This is the one you want to grab. Uh, I encourage you to, to take a look at this. I hope this session has been helpful in covering when we build next-gen applications, we're using event-driven architectures, you want to be thinking ahead. 
right? You want to think, how do I decouple? How do I get my system resilient, right? It's up to us as architects to say, when this fails, I'm going to make it, you know, I'm going to make it work. And, and we build resiliency in. I hope you understand event-driven, how that works, choreography and, and orchestration. And finally, item potency, which is one of the biggest challenges that folks deal with on how to work with that. I encourage you to grab this QR code. If you've not been to serverless land, check out serverless land. We have a lot going on there. It was just updated. It looks fresh and new. We've got some more stuff uh, going on there. Uh, if you want to continue your serverless learning, we have uh, s12d.com serverless learning QR code here. And finally, thank you very much. That's my Twitter handle. I would love for you to follow me. I, I warn you, you're going to hear about serverless EDA. You're going to hear about pizza and why pineapple shouldn't be on it and uh, Diet Dr. Pepper and all kinds of things. With that, thank you very much. Y'all have a great day. Enjoy reInvent. Thank you.